<laughs> so, in, in her highway collections with the goats feed, feeding on the, the, the yeah, gas. Right. They might produce more gas than they uh, than they, than we want them to, though. So, <laughs> um, yeah, we don't we don't have a but so, anyway. The sectors, it's interesting. You know, there's there's not so much um, generated from waste, but transportation and what's called stationary energy are about equal. Um, waste, of course, is the management, disposal, and decomposition of waste materials. Transportation, you know, it's vehicles, moving people and goods. And stationary energy is uh, consumption in fixed locations. So it's really like things that you are used to heat and cool and power buildings and other facilities that stay put. But if you look at the breakdown, uh, we'll start with waste. Um, uh, <clears throat> the emissions from wastewater, you know, are typically, uh, or the, the, the emissions from waste are typically methane and carbon dioxide. Uh, in Topsum, the largest percentage is uh, wastewater from septic tanks. Uh, and then municipal solid waste, which is landfilled and flaring emissions. And then a little bit from effluent discharge estimated from the Brunswick Sewer District. Again, like that's the emissions from the digestive digestion process. Right. Transportation. Uh, passenger vehicles, they're dominant, accounting for about 70% of the total transportation emissions. Uh, commercial vehicles contribute just over 27%. And public transportation accounts for only 2.5% of the total. So we need more of it. Yeah, we we need process. We well, it. it's pretty, you know, it's pretty telling on things that could be done, uh, I think. It is. Uh, stationary energy is a little more complicated because there's a greater variety of ways to heat, cool, and power homes and businesses. Um, so residential fuel, oil, and kerosene, if you can see that one, uh, it's kind of the lower left, um, is, the, uh, about, is the largest share, and that's about a quarter of all emissions. And that's followed by commercial electricity electricity up in the upper right, uh, residential electricity and commercial natural gas. Those are the four, four big ones. So residential fuel oil, kerosene, commercial or industrial electricity, uh, residential electricity, and then commercial natural gas. It kind of makes sense. Yeah. Carrying mm -hmm. on to municipal greenhouse gas inventory. That is about 748 metric tons, which is about 748 Honda Civics. I won't go through the whole thing, but it's about 150,000 household caps. Perfect. Uh, municipal sectors, so we didn't do waste because we just don't have the data for the waste that's generated just by the municipal operations. Like it's, it's negligible. Uh, but again, you know, transportation and stationary energy were about equal. Um, not if you break down transportation, um, not surprisingly, public works has the greatest share, and that's followed by the police department. And you know that makes sense because they drive around a lot in the course of doing their jobs. Looking at stationary energy. 65% uh, of emissions are generated by the municipal offices. And this is kind of just kind of a big uh, lump sum uh, based on uh, the way that we could get the information. It's not broken down you know, by each and every um, building or uh, department. Mm -hmm. uh, so it in kind of includes everybody. Um, but the interesting thing about that is that uh, the breakdown is 60% uh, of emissions come from natural gas, which is for heating and hot water, and 40% come from electric use. The library has a little share of that uh, as well. 
So municipal efforts today, you know, the Topsum has been quite proactive uh, in lowering their greenhouse gas emissions. They have piloted an electric police car. Meg, I thought they did a hybrid. The hybrid, yeah. Oh, hybrid. Okay, thank you. Unless you heard something else. No, it was. Uh, no, it was yeah, 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 yeah. It was a hybrid, right? Okay, yeah. thank you. I'll change that. Is it the whole fleet or is it it's just, just, one. just one car? It's just yeah. got one car. Yeah. Yeah. I saw one car. I thought they were, I was they hoping could, there was more than one. They couldn't okay. find again. Ah, uh, they tried to get one. It's they, been a headache. It's been a headache trying to get them. Well, maybe they hope they'll try again. But, you know, good, good for them for trying it out. And, you know, you find out what works and what doesn't work. And, the, you know, as things um, improve in that area, they'll, they'll be able to um, get one that works better for them, I'm sure. Um, the municipal building uh, has energy efficient systems, insulation, heat pumps, you know, LED lighting. The town purchases solar credits to offset um, their electric use. They've installed, you've installed uh, LED streetlights. And then of course, you know, LED lighting and other facilities. Uh, and then it purchased electric equipment like the, um, the recreational department, recreation department said they have uh, electric chainsaws, I believe they said, or the, uh, the fire department also has some electric equipment. So they are, uh, it is on the, as it makes sense uh, and is feasible, they're uh, doing these good things. Mm. Strategies for reducing, you know, these are very high level. There are lots of activities that can be done. And, you know, Julia will get into those as we start to do the climate action planning. But just from our, uh, from the report, you know, there's, there's nothing really new under the sun here, but focusing on improving energy efficiency in homes and businesses and municipal operations is gonna be key. You know, encouraging the public to participate, especially in energy efficient, uh, efficiency main rebates is a great idea. Facilitate alternative forms of transportation uh, and electric vehicle adoption and increasing, yeah, increasing uh, adoption of electric vehicles where it makes sense. Efficiency main has just adopted whole heating systems, electric systems for trailers too now for mobile homes. And that's, that's another right. idea. They piloted it and it worked. Um, so they can, put heat, they can put heat pumps right in your mobile home now, and you can get a good return and pay, amount of it paid for by the state. That's great. Yeah. So for more information, um, we'll have the report available, 25 pages. It talks about the methodology, the data sources. I have more detailed breakdowns. Like There's a lot more charts and graphs in there. Um, I have more detailed reduction strategies. We have a comparison between 2009, and then we are gonna include the Mount Ararat High School student projects as an appendix as well. So. And that, will there be printed copies of this around, Meg, that, that we can have in the town office for people to look at as well as online? Uh, right. Yeah, that's up to um, Sky and our you know printing budget, but they, it, it is a, there's printable versions for sure. Thank you. I'll probably print one for myself to keep in a binder if someone wants to see that they can. We don't get a lot of requests to see printed materials. Yeah, but I'm just thinking there'll be people that don't have internet access who might be interested in what's, and, if, what's and, and so they can look at mine. Yeah. We yeah. try to keep our printing to a minimum. Okay, okay. I will send them to you. Is it on the Google Drive? Not yet. Not yet, how? <laughs> I don't think I know you. <laughs> I'm really I'm I'm uh, I'd, I'd love for you to take a look at that. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I had a really crazy. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> okay. Well, it'll be there sometime. Yes. Too. Yeah. All right. So anyway, thoughts, feedback, questions. That was cool. I, I, um, yeah. Did you uh, what do what do you think about food waste, like composting food waste mm -hmm. and stuff? Would that be negligible or significant you know i think if we're really every every bit helps <laughs> I, you know it really does as you can see like kind of waste is not a huge part of the package you know focusing on transportation and um efficiency uh in building and transitioning to electricity um there if there are high impact actions you can take for that, uh, those are going to give you the kind of the highest um, 
kind of return on investment. But composting certainly is um, a great way to for yeah. for communities state, to do that. The state waste department was giving grants out to do yeah. municipal composting. I tried to interest our, our solid waste manager in applying for that, and right. I. I failed to, to engage him. He he has an encouraging, but oh, very slightly, it, give, handing out how do you compost at home. But he's not interested in expanding what he's doing there. He wasn't. He's not interested in any work and thinking and planning to go out for state money. He said, "Oh, I've always got enough money for the town. I don't need to do this." You know, right. That's the right. attitude. So I tried. I yeah. really tried hard because yeah. I think it makes a big difference. And he's already doing composting. And he oh, he's got a really he, active. And he could have had more money yeah. to pay, enlarge the pavement from the state, so he yeah. could do a lot more bigger operations. Yeah. I tried. Well, it's not over yet. <laughs> how he gets out of there. He's uneducated. And he's he just needs a hug. Yeah. <laughs> um, he likes being the kingpin for a little town. Yeah. Shop. Basically. I'll give him the hug. You give him the hug. Yeah. I'm, I'm past Actually, hugging him. Am I, am I eligible to ask a question? You may. Okay. Um, I am just curious as to why um, what they sometimes call black carbon uh, particulates, 2.5 micron and lower particulates, are not included in the greenhouse gases. I believe EPA does, so. I am not sure I'm understanding your question. Well, you had a list at, toward the beginning of the greenhouse gases, um, yep. carbon dioxide and several other very common ones, but I think there are seven total, of which one, I think, is 2.5 micron or lower particulates. And I just wondered why they weren't in the list. You They're know, important for human health, um, among right. other things. I, I, but they're not, I need to go back into the yeah, data. Yeah. What, what we used was a... Um, a calculator um, called ClearPath, and mm -hmm. there there are a lot of um, greenhouse gases measured. Mm -hmm. For a presentation like like this, I was kind of trying to keep it kind of high level, mm -hmm. um, so I can find out whether those two point five uh, micron particulate are included. Um, I'd have to get back to. You. Yeah. Okay. Well, if it's just like on oh, the top level, that also makes sense. I just that's I, that makes sense too. But I can also add to that that um, when you're doing greenhouse gas inventories, they focus on the um, greenhouse gas emissions or greenhouse gases that impact global warming um, and climate change. And so it's focusing on the, the ones that are the greatest contributors to climate change and that are also most related to emissions from human activities. So if my understanding is the 2.5 particulates are more related to human health and air quality concerns and less related to um, climate change and, um, and global warming. Not that there isn't some impact, but I think that it's a lesser degree than you know, CO2, methane, um, and some of the other ones. Yeah. I believe EPA defines these particulates as one of the seven greenhouse gases that they track. That's why I was asking. Right, right. I think they, I think they are. They have a contribution, but it's just not as great. So, ClearPath just focuses on the the ones that have a greater impact. I mean, would it make sense to add methane to that list? Yes. Um, I, I, I don't know. I'm just wondering. I'm just wondering. Uh, I'm wondering about carbon dioxide. Uh, keeping it such a short list, you know, because you got methane and you got refrigerants, you know, that are I have methane in there. I have carbon dioxide, mm -hmm. methane, nitrous oxide, and fluorinated gas. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Excuse no, me. They're in there. Yeah. yeah but... I can't read fast enough. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's all right. It goes by fast. I don't know. Is it too yeah. is it like a, is it a good level of information? Is it a, a lot too much? Well, I felt I felt it was really, really very good. And yeah. I say that as a former teacher. So <laughs> I agree. I think simple and hitting the main categories yeah. is enough to get people informed. Otherwise, you overwhelm them. Yeah, right. I think I think most people are going to get one or two takeaways. And I think transportation, yeah. <laughs> right, and and home energy efficiency is another big yeah. one. I think those yeah. are the if those are the two takeaways that people get, that's great. I mean, that's yeah. that's a start. Yeah. Considering where a lot of people are coming. 
All right. Well, I, I look for a, I don't want to cut anybody off. Anything else? No. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that feedback. And um, yeah, and I'm curious and uh, to have you guys take a look at the full report comment. Um, How can we do that, Meg? You're going to, you're going to send it eventually and get, it'll get on our document that we can yeah. get access. Okay. I'd like to look at it in detail. Thank you for all that work. You're welcome. So you're going to put it on. You, you I just need to finish looking at it. Meg's asked me to do that. Um, I'll hopefully have time tomorrow and or the next day. We'll see. Um, and then I'll let her know what my findings, feelings are. And I think then we'll get it out to everyone. Is that your thought, Meg? Yeah, the, then the reason I was, you know, sharing it with Sky is that there's some recommendations. Um, you know, sort of planning recommendations, like ordinance things, um, you know, that I, I'm i not sure that Sky and her position are ready to commit to, and I just didn't want to put it out there into the wild, you know, until there was something like, you know, that that she had a, a chance to know what. Good idea. <laughs> right. Got it. Yeah. Makes sense. Well, I guess that's that's good. Thanks. Thank you. Yep. And you have twenty five more minutes. <laughs> so, Julia, do you want to you want to go now? Sure. <laughs> um, so I can also uh, before jumping into the vulnerability assessment, I can also give a little overview of what we're thinking about for the second workshop. Um, so I don't know if you guys had talked about that at all before I joined. Okay, no. great. So the goal for the second workshop is really going to be uh, prioritizing climate action strategies and getting input from the community about what climate action strategies they're most interested in um, and ultimately using that input and information to create a prioritized, refined list of climate action strategies that are going to be included in the climate action plan. So our plan is to start the workshop with um, presentations of the infrastructure vulnerability assessment and the greenhouse gas inventory. I. Uh, the social vulnerability assessment, I think, is a question whether that will be a part of that workshop or not. I don't know. Um, it depends on sort of where Jessica's at. But so basically presenting the information that we're presenting to you tonight. Um, and then the second half of the workshop is going to be sort of a gallery style um, type of activity where we're going to have boards that have categorize climate action strategies and people will be able to move through each of those um, categories of strategies and we'll have sticky dots so people can vote on the ones that they care a lot about. Um, people can provide notes on them and then we'll all be milling around um, to help answer people's questions if they have them about any specific strategies um, and um, you know, also just have any other conversations with people that, you know, people want to have. Um, so that's, it's a little less kind of formalized structured approach, um, but I've participated in one of these before. Um, and I think it's actually a really nice way for people to kind of spend a little more time in areas that they're really interested in. And, you know, you know, maybe not so much in certain areas that they don't necessarily have as much to offer. Um, so yeah, that's the general plan. Um, any thoughts or questions about that? I went to the session that Brunswick held on exactly the topic you're talking about, and it was done excellently. They had, I think, as many as eight or nine different areas that they of topics that they prioritize strategies under. I'd like to know what. Have you looked at their work so that you have an idea of what those range of things are? Now, municipal housing buildings, uh, natural lands, uh, and transportation. Uh, I can't remember all nine categories, but it's important to include the whole range separately on those bulletin boards so people can think about the strategies to relate it on the, each, each 
topic of town. And yeah, go. so it, it we are using a full range of strategies. So I am not familiar with Brunswick, Brunswick's work specifically. My um, coworker who's also involved in this project at more of a senior level, she was the sustainability planner, I, I think, or environmental planner there for a while. So I think she may have actually run that workshop. Um, but we're using a, it's a climate action strategy matrix that was developed by the Southern Maine Planning and Development Commission as part of this climate action planning cohort that they ran last year. Um, so they developed this very comprehensive strategy um, that includes, I think it's, um, and I'm going to send this to you guys um, after this workshop. Um, I just didn't want to send it. You have enough to review with the assessment. So I will send this to you, but I think there's maybe five categories and over a hundred strategies. Um, so it's very comprehensive. And so the, the challenge with that is that it's too comprehensive to present at a community workshop. So we're working on refining that and presenting sort of the key pieces of that so that we can get people's input. Um, yeah, and so I forgot to mention that those, um, those sort of refined lists for each categories, we're gonna share those with you before the next energy committee meeting. So you all have a chance to provide some input on them um, and we can either scratch certain strategies or add additional ones um, if you think anything's missing. Mm -hmm. Great. Cool. cool. All right. So um, I did not prepare a presentation um, about the assessment, but I was going to just share a couple highlights. Before I do that, and this is not a test, who has had a chance to review the assessment or take a look at it at all? Has anybody had a chance to look at it? I didn't know about it. <laughs> oh, okay. I thought Yvette had sent it out, but maybe she didn't. Um, I didn't notice it. Okay. No. I reviewed it because I was on the email. Oh. <laughs> no, sorry. That was just a joke. Um, I So were they reviewing it for this meeting, Julia? No, I. that's totally fine. I thought Yvette had sent it to the whole committee um, so people would have a chance to review it, but obviously that didn't happen, so no worries. Can you send it out to us? I now? will, yeah. Yes, Please? I will. Um, so I can share my screen and let's see, let's do this. All right. So, oh, whoops. I think I shared. Okay. All right, so can you all see the document that's on my screen? Mm -hmm. Yes. Do I need to zoom in more or can you see that all right? Zoom in a little more, please. Oops, sorry. <laughs> oh. Is that better? Oh, it's about the same. It just went backwards. It was good there for a second. Yeah, there, go. there we go. Okay. That's okay. good. Okay. Well, that's good. Very good. Okay, so this is the table of contents for the plan. Um, so we have an executive summary with key findings and then what we're calling vulnerability focus areas. Um, the introduction, which is, you know, some background information about climate change, what Topsum has already done and how this assessment um, is a part of the overall climate action plan update. Um, and then we have an overview of the community input that we collected. This was from the workshop, um, as well as um, we have a very brief summary of the survey. I know that you all are going to do a deeper dive in, into that. Um, and then also some conversations I had with um, the uh, water district and some town staff. Um, and then these are the climate hazards that we focused on. So extreme storms and changing precipitation patterns, flooding and sea level rise, increasing temperatures, shifting habitats um, and agriculture, and then drought and wildfire. Um, and so then we also produced a number of maps um, for the report. 
So I'll try to share those with you. It might be a little hard with the screen sharing to actually see the maps, um, but we'll, we'll give it a try. So I need to zoom out on these ones. So I think there are eight maps in the plan um, that are related to each of those climate hazard categories. Um, so the first map is really looking at sort of erosion vulnerability and then also salt marsh migration. Um, so these green areas, these are existing wetland habitat. Um, and then this blue hatched area is um, are areas that are projected to become tidal marsh habitat in the future with sea level rise. So you can see the whole area around the Muddy River um, is expected to become tidal marsh habitat. And that's by that's on the long term by the year 2100. Um, and then we also mapped um, coastal bluff stability, which there is not a lot of that mapped in Topsum. Um, there's just a few areas here along kind of the lower Androscoggin. Um, and I think the takeaway from that is there, there are not any areas that are highly unstable, um, but obviously there are areas where Topsum is already experiencing erosion, especially um, the Pleasant Point Road. Um, so I think the key takeaway from this map is really just this potential salt, salt marsh migration around the Muddy River. Yeah. So this map is looking at what I'm calling stormwater vulnerability. Um, and so with climate change, we're expected, we're already seeing increased precipitation in the state of Maine. I think we're all experiencing that. Um, and we're expected to see precipitation continue to increase in the future. We're also experiencing more intense rainfall events, um, which sounds like we're gonna get one tomorrow. Um, and so one of the concerns with that is stormwater runoff, um, which is already a concern in Topsom, um, particularly in the Topsom, Fall, Topsom Fair Mall area. Um, and the town is actively working on some projects there, just installed a bioinfiltration system, uh, which I heard is beautiful. Um, cool. And there, so on the map here, these gray shaded areas that's showing um, impervious surfaces and the darker areas are areas that are more impervious. So you can see that the area around the tops and fair mall is highly impervious. So that's like all the parking lots and buildings and stuff. And the issue with that is that in impervious surfaces, where there are impervious surfaces, the water can't percolate into the soil. So it just runs off into those water bodies and causes water quality issues. Um, these orange areas are two, the two urban impaired stream watersheds in the, in the town. Um, so that's a state designation. Um, and so these are areas where stormwater runoff is already an issue. Um, and I think where it could continue to be an issue um, in the future. And then all of these, it's a little hard to see because there's so many of them, but and also on the screen share, it's not so zoomed in, but all of these uh, little yellow dots are catch basins. Um, and so I just wanted to show kind of where catch basins and stormwater infrastructure overlap with impervious surfaces. Um, so you can see that there is pretty good overlap, but there are some, you know, there are some areas um, that don't have as much stormwater infrastructure, um, at least, or I should say at least catch basins. Um, so then moving on to the next map, um, this is, so the next three maps that I'm going to show are mapping flooding vulnerability. And so this is flooding from storm events and extreme precipitation. So this is not future flooding. Um, this is current flooding conditions. Unfortunately, we don't have, um, there are no models available right now um, that show projected future flooding. Um, so I think you just have to understand that this is showing what the flooding conditions are currently, um, but in the future with extreme precipitation events and increasing precipitation and sea level rise, the extent of these vulnerable areas could increase. Julia, what is it green and blue or, or light, light no, blue? No, oh, is. yeah. So the blue, the light blue areas, those are the areas that are 
vulnerable to what's called a 1% annual chance flood event. Um, so that's like a pretty likely, um, but you know, still pretty extreme flood event. These mm -hmm. orange areas, which are pretty hard to see, um, but there are a few of them. So if I zoom in to, yeah. um, so you can see there's some orange areas right here. That's the 0.2% um, chance annual flood hazard area. So that's sort of areas that are vulnerable to really catastrophic flooding. And then the green areas are showing where existing conserved lands are. And so the reason I wanted to show where the conserved lands are is because when, well, I, I guess I should say that conserving land or protecting land in areas that are vulnerable to flooding is a, you know, a proven flood mitigation strategy. And looking at Topsum, there's actually a lot of overlap between existing conserved lands and areas that are vulnerable to flooding, which is, at least in my experience, relatively unique. Um, I think especially around the cat ants up here. Can you guys see my cursor on my screen? I don't know if yes. you can. Oh, Wait, no, I don't. Yes. Sort of. Yes. Yeah. It's... Over blue, we can see. It's yeah. Um. I can so see up, it. Up here, you know, there are some conserved lands, and then around the muddy river, and yeah. there's a lot that's especially around the muddy river. This is the um, the state wildlife management area. Um, yeah. So this is state land, and then there's also a lot of land trust land that um, overlaps with these flood prone areas. So I think that's a really interesting area um, for Topsum to think about is, you know, either expanding existing conserved areas um, to improve the existing flood mitigation benefits. Um, and yeah, I think it also, you know, there isn't as much um, compared to some towns, there isn't as much built along some of these very flood prone areas like the upper cat ants and around the muddy river. So I think that's, you know, that's good for Topsum. Um, well, <laughs> the upper top, the upper cat ants is <laughs> all kind of marsh. So there's not, you can't really build much on it. Exactly, so yeah. <laughs> uh, do, you, do you have a, a map of our focus areas for conservation? Because no, I don't. You should overlay this with that. That um, would be great. Um, Do you is that like a, a in a shape file form that you guys have? The town office should have. I mean, the okay. town planning office should have that. They have the the um, um, what's it called? Um, the habitat. The, the, the map we use for habitat mitigation. I know our GIS files are a mess. I know oh, is it the beginning of habitat? I'm, okay, um, what? Maps? No, no, no. It's just as the oh. town. It's the natural areas plan. It's a natural areas plan. Oh. Came out of the natural areas plan. Yeah. I def okay. We definitely have pictures. I yeah. just, our our GIS files are. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know what? Make, what may make sense is just there. There is kind of a. It's kind of a. There's several bubbles. Let's put it that way. And maybe just a, a circle, a rough circle around where those sure. areas are off of the some of the printed national areas uh, map. Natural areas plan maps would be sufficient mm -hmm. just to show people that this this is where we're focusing conservation on and it overlaps pretty much with where we're expecting this flooding. So yeah, um, yeah, we can so. we can compare the two of those. It's also if so you'll you'll all have a chance to review this and provide any feedback. So if you want to, uh, Victor, right from the yeah. yeah from the conservation commission. So if you want to, you know. If there are certain areas that you would like us to highlight on this map, um, you know, let us know and we can we can highlight those. Okay. Um, yeah, because I think that would be great to understand um, on this map where where the town is thinking about protecting um, additional areas. Um, so looking at areas of concern, um, I think the Meadow Road. Um, that's a known area of concern that certainly shows up here um, as, as a vulnerable area. Foreside Road um, and Pleasant Point Road are both vulnerable and known vulnerable areas. There are also a number of homes um, along Foreside Road adjacent to the Muddy River that are vulnerable to flooding um, and are in the floodplain. Um, around 
the cadence area, um, sort of where 295 crosses, there's a couple of bridges that are vulnerable to flooding, um, as well as this mobile home park that you had all been mentioning, the access road, um, and a few of the units are in that floodplain area. Um, so I think that <laughs> is definitely an area of concern. Um, there are a few areas kind of off of River Road, um, and then I think this is, I can't remember if this is still River Road or Winter Street um, down here, but I think, and this is the street off of River Road, I think is like Flying Eagle Drive or something like that, um, and there are a few homes on that road that are also um, within the, the flood um, hazard area. Um, two areas that I think um, the town should be thinking about our um, sort of as we head towards Lisbon Falls, kind of along Lewiston Road, um, this part of town is zoned as the industrial zone, um, but there are also a few areas that are within the floodplain. There's the Grimmels Industries and then also a gravel pit that are both within the floodplain. So I think flooding of those two sites is a concern for the owners, but I think it could also pretend, uh, present potential environmental impacts. Um, so I think that's, and there were a few folks during the workshop that also mentioned concerns about particularly Grimmel's industries, um, if that were to flood. Um, so I think that's- Yeah, I have a question. Uh, I want to- Yeah, go ahead. There's two, be two areas in town, and I can't pinpoint them exactly for you, where people are getting, uh, the groundwater level is rising. Oh, that's that's on yes. there. Have you got that on there? Ivanhoe. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that. Um, so there are, so Ivanhoe Drive and Bay Park are the two areas that people mentioned they're having groundwater inundation issues. Um, I think at the level of data and information that we have at this point, I think, I, I know there was a former planning board member who was at um, the workshop and was telling me about the Bay Park neighborhood and that when that was built, it was built in an area with a high water table. Um, so yeah. the groundwater inundation has always been an issue there. So I think yeah. the concern there is that increasing precipitation could increase wow. the groundwater table and could make that existing problem worse. So. Yeah. It's, you know, I think it's a, it's a historic problem that could be exacerbated by climate change, but is not the, the issue that people are experiencing isn't necessarily caused by current, current trends that we've experienced over the last few years. The Ivanhoe Drive neighborhood, it sounded, there were some people who said, you know, this is a new thing that we're experiencing. Some people who said it's happened in the past. Um, so I think that's a little bit more of a question mark whether that's a change or not. Um, but I, I would say that, you know, monitoring the groundwater inundation issues in those two neighborhoods is going to be pretty important. I think the other thing to understand is how surface waters are, um, you know, where surface waters are going during extreme rainfall events, because it's not just groundwater from underneath that can cause flooding problems like flooded basements. When we have these really extreme precipitation events, um, water surface waters can also run off, um, you know, into people's basements and cause cause flooding issues. So I think sort of pinpointing what the issue is in that neighborhood in particular would be um, would be helpful for the town and for addressing the residents concerns. Great. All right, any other questions about this map before I move on to the next one? Very good. Okay, so the next map is showing those same um, flooding vulnerability layers um, overlain with the sewer infrastructure. And so this green or sort of teal area that shows the area of town that is served by um, the sewer district. Mm -hmm. And you can see there's a pretty small area right along here between Bridge Street and Summer Street. Um, there's that sort of river path along there. Um, and there is some very limited sewer infrastructure that's within the, the flood zone. Mm -hmm. um, 
the concern with that infrastructure is not so much that it's going to get flooded. I think the, the concern is more that the flooding could cause washouts of the infrastructure, which especially for sewer is a concern because it can cause contamination. Um, but overall, I would say that the vulnerability of the sewer infrastructure is pretty low, um, at least to flooding. So I think that's good news for Topsum. Well, actually, um, down here on the Androscoggin, isn't this where the... It's outside of the floodplain. It's 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 raised. It's raised. And it's off raised. Yeah, so I was going to say, because yep. it's raised. It's surrounded by low area. I okay. was looking at it as well, but I, I don't yeah. know if you've been out there, but it's it's raised about five feet up. Yeah, is this the where the sewer, is. the treatment plant is? The it's where the pine... Um, yeah, in the Pine Street area, there's an interconnect pine with wood. Brunswick Sewer District. That's where our sewer goes. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I, I, if, okay. So it's I'm not looking at the map. It looks like it's surrounded by it to me, Victor, rather than. Yeah. Okay. I was just curious. because. <laughs> yeah, that's my, so I, you know, I think that currently it's outside of the, the flood zone area. I think that's, you know, and I didn't, the sewer district, I wasn't able to connect with them. Um, so I don't know if they have, um, you know, any ongoing plans, you know, related to that. Um, but currently they're, they're not, um, you know, designated as being vulnerable um, to flooding, but they are, they are close to the river. Um, all right. Any other questions oh, for Gloria? We were talking. We were talking about the inter the um, pump station near Pinewood Drive that sends our sewer across the river. Oh, no. oh, sorry, sorry. I thought you were talking about the treatment plant. Okay. No, yeah. I realized as you ended. I think I think it's in an okay place for yeah. knowledge of it, but that is what we were talking. About. I I did look at the Pine Street pump station, and that that's without that is outside of the um of the of the modeled flood hazard area, but I do agree that it is, it is sort of surrounded by flooded areas. Um, yeah. So, which I don't know if that necessarily is a concern for the sewer district that it sort of would be cut off for them during a storm event, but it does seem like the actual pump station itself is, um, is low risk for flooding. Yeah. yeah. I was down there in person like a year ago and um, it doesn't look like any Pinewood Drive is flooding, and there is a access road to level with Pinewood Drive. It, you feel like you're like, it feels very easy that it would be flooded and you would be surrounded by water. I, I can't really describe it. If you yeah, yeah, there, I've, I've been down there. Yeah, yeah it's I, actually. I, I can decent. see that. Actually, but... there's one house there that is being very badly flooded. No. I don't know if it's more than one. It's not on that map, so that's I what I'm saying. But and then it may be city infrastructure that's doing it. It's yeah. not clear. Yeah. It's in a, yeah. a big place, it doesn't. Actually, yes. I had a question as well about the area over uh, on what is actually Twin Pond Road. Um, I'm pointing at the screen, which of course is not going to help you very much. But um, if you look um, out towards that, well, is it here? Uh, that's Fox Run. No, that's Fox oh, Run. It's Fox, the next there, one. there. That's yeah. it. That's it. Right where those two little ponds are. That's Twin Pond Road. Yeah, yeah. that makes yeah. sense. And I noticed that that area is actually the houses there are not shown as flooding. But I will tell you, boy, and I mean, I believe you that that's what FEMA says, but At the very if end you go down the there in springtime, you really do wonder whether that's going to be accurate or not. Because <clears throat> you can see where the natural sort of historic bank of the river is there. And it really, on big rainstorms, like in these last two storms we had in December or January of last year, um, it was very near tipping over. I, it's, it would be surprising to me that you get almost got your house on one, your, your pointer on one house there. Oh, I just realized Julie can't see my cursor. It, oh, that's your um, cursor. Yeah, I think I know there's like, fo there's Fox Run Road. And then if I look to the right of it, yes. yeah, there's yeah. that road coming and the two little ponds. It's called Twin Pond Road. Yeah. And yes, it's those two little ponds. And uh, those houses down there, uh, especially the oh I guess you can't see um, Sky's pointer but there's one house that's particularly near the river and if you go down there in a big storm you'll find that the river is running very near the top of very the near its historical top you know the the creek beds will come and there'll be a little dip and then there'll be another dip and then there'll be the river well it's up up at the top of the highest dip it's it's high very high in fact there were kayaks that were 
stored there um, that completely washed away. Yeah. Um, they Everybody thought they were on dry land. Ha, 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 not. Uh, <laughs> one of them got hung up in a tree and so forth. Um, I, I'm surprised that it doesn't show that it's flooding. It might be that that's what FEMA shows. I'm just saying in real life, when you go and look at it, that doesn't look very realistic. Julia, I found it really helpful to look at the FEMA projections of sea level rise for Topsom into the future. Have you done that? To see, we other... are, yeah, that's one of the next maps. So we'll look okay. at that. Okay. Um, yeah, and I, so I can add a note about the Twin Pond Roads um, and just, so, you know, that's something we can just mention that, you know, there are certain areas that were noted by um, by community members during the workshop that don't show up on these maps, um, like Ward Road was one and also some flooding on Pinewood Drive. So I noted those areas in the plan, even though the, the FEMA modeled flood areas um, don't necessarily show flooding there because people are experiencing it. So we can add another note about um, the Twin Ponds Road to capture that. Um, all right, so I'll move on to the next map. So this is showing the um, flood hazard areas and uh, vulnerable water infrastructure. Um, and I did have a conversation with the water district um, about some of the work that they've done, um, which is primar prim primar primarily, um, <laughs> sorry, I can't say that word tonight. <laughs> Um, has been thinking about the vulnerabilities of their treatment stations um, because the Jordan Ave station in Brunswick is within the floodplain and it has flooded in the past. Um, and then the Taylor station, which is also in Brunswick, um, is also within the floodplain and it hasn't flooded, but it's not in a great area. Um, so there's the new Holden station um, which was built next to an older station, which I forget the name of. Um, but so they built this new station out of the floodplain um, to make it, you know, resilient to flooding. Um, so it's definitely something that they're thinking a lot about. Um, and then looking at infrastructure that's vulnerable, there's very limited um, uh, water infrastructure. Um, we really just looked at where the water mains were and where they overlapped with um, areas vulnerable to flooding. Um, and there's very little overlap. There's a couple of areas along um, River Road and along Bridge Street, um, but it's very limited. Um, we also looked at the state has a, um, a data set of, um, of groundwater wells. It's not a complete data set. It's only wells that have been drilled um, after I think like 1980. Um, so it's not comprehensive, but um, we looked at that just to see also if there were certain areas where there was a lot of wells that were potentially vulnerable to flooding. That's again, not so much an inundation problem, but more just damage to the infrastructure. So there were a couple of um, domestic wells, particularly around the the cat ants, um, and then kind of along river road that could potentially be vulnerable to flooding. Um, but again, I think similar to sewer infrastructure, the water infrastructure is not quite as vulnerable to flooding. I think the main concern in terms of flooding for Topsom is really the, um, the industrial zone and then also some of the, the roads and bridges that are vulnerable. So I think it's really transportation and um, and buildings and that industrial zone. Um, so those are kind of the key takeaways for flooding from storms. Um, does anyone have questions about that before I move on to sea level rise? Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is the sea level rise um, map and projections for Topsom. So this, these are sea level modeled scenarios that were developed by the Maine Geological Survey. Um, and so we used two modeled scenarios, um, 3.9 feet of sea level rise and 1.6 feet of sea level rise. So we use these because the state of Maine um, in the Maine Won't Wait Climate Action Plan that was published a few years back, um, the state recommended that communities plan for um, about 
uh, one and a half feet of sea level rise by 2050 and about four feet of sea level rise by 2100. So these two scenarios are the closest to those recommendations from the state. Um, so you can also sort of think about it as 3.9 feet is sort of long-term sea level rise and 1.6 feet is shorter term sea level rise. So looking at the map, um, the green areas are the uh, conserved lands again. Um, and then the light blue area is the 1.6, or sorry, is the 3.9 feet of sea level rise. And there's a darker blue area, which is showing 1.6 feet of sea level rise, but it's very minimal, just kind of right along. If you look in some of these inset maps, you can see it just kind of right along the river. Um, I will say that the state is currently updating these models um, to create a more, this is what's called a bathtub model, and they're going to be developing a dynamic flood model, which basically sort of incorporates a lot more localized information and is supposed to be more accurate. Um, so I think particularly where Topsom is located at the, at the kind of end of the tidal influence of the river, um, I, I think those new um, flood models that are coming from, or sea level rise models that are coming from the state could provide some helpful information um, about sort of the specific extent of sea level rise, but this is what we have currently. Um, and so I think looking at sort of sea level rise in the short term, there's pretty minimal impact um, for Topsom. I think the main impact would be to that four-side road bridge so that floods during storms currently, and with sea level rise, um, it would be, you'd expect it to flood more frequently and potentially even start flooding on just regular high tides. And then looking at sort of longer term sea level rise, um, that's those light uh, blue areas. The impacts are really isolated to the areas around the muddy river um, and then kind of low lying areas near Pleasant Point and Foreside Roads. Um, and then there's two areas along Pleasant Point Road um, that are vulnerable to um, that long-term sea level rise scenario. Um, another sort of similar to the flood prone areas, um, a lot of the area that is vulnerable to sea level rise is in conservation. It's part of that wildlife management area in those existing wetlands um, around the Muddy River. So I think in terms of kind of areas in town that are vulnerable, um, the sort of infrastructure vulnerability is pretty, pretty limited. Um, and it's also areas that the town is already aware of and is dealing with flooding and erosion issues, um, which I think is helpful. I think the, like I talked about earlier, the main thing to keep in mind is how the habitat around the Muddy River could change over time. Um, you know, what kind of impacts that will have for, um, you know, for that landscape as well as for the habitat. Um, so yeah, those are the key, key takeaways for sea level rise. Um, any questions about those? Looks like you nailed the, <laughs> the right places there. <laughs> what, the state is rebuilding that bridge um, on Forsyth Road, um, and they have claimed that they're going to take into account uh, um, sea level rise. Um, although they said it was going to be difficult because the roadbed would need to be increased. Yeah. Quite a bit. Yeah, going yeah. back in both directions, which is outside the scope of their, <laughs> of course, um, you know, work. So anyway, so I don't know. They may be talking with the town. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, Sky, you had mentioned that you all were talking. There were, there was work, ongoing work about that bridge, right? I got notified last summer, um, and. I haven't heard anything else. Um, I don't think that it's within the town's scope to raise that roadbed right now. I would hope that DOT takes 
it into account because there's a big difference between raising a bridge and raising a roadbed. <laughs> um, and that one can happen in a year and one cannot. <laughs> but I actually don't know much about that project. It's fully DOT and uh, they aren't really talking to us about that one. Pleasant Point is where most of our act actions are right now. Okay. So four side road and the flooding associated with that is coming up in talks we're having about Pleasant Point. So that whole area is, there's nothing on here we're unaware of. Um, well, actually, what is three? Yeah, I was wondering what that is. This is a uh, part of Pleasant Point Road. This is oh, where Pleasant right. Point Road okay. starts. Yeah. yeah, right. And then farther down Pleasant Point Road is number two. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Still, so, so we're aware of all those. Can you briefly summarize what the town's doing on Pleasant Point? Well, I feel like I should know what they're doing. So we um, contracted with Spago Technics for them to prepare proposals to handle erosion, undercutting, and flooding. Um, we have had at least two meetings with residents of Pleasant Point to see what they would like us to do. Um, and we're doing emergency stabilization in the most um, damaged area this fall Which, um, to preserve the road. And is that near Forsyth, going yeah. down the slope there? Yeah. No, no yeah. it's farther, it's down. That's down. not where we're doing the emergency work. Oh. That's what floods. Um, the emergency work is undercutting on the bank further down. So in all reality, the part that floods on Pleasant Point is actually one of the least concerning. It's the undercutting underneath the roadbed further along. Okay. That's actually okay. more of a safety concern. And some of the people at Pleasant Point really don't want us to do anything and they're fine with it flooding. Yeah, yeah, I've heard that too. Yeah, that is a common refrain. You know what? It might not be the same once the flooding really gets bad. That may or may be a change, but there there is this concept of, you know, do we want to put the money into raising it? Maybe, you know, what I can't remember the exact numbers, like six inches or whatever it would take to get past where we kind of are now and some future projections when they're saying they're okay with it and it, it could get worse and it would be better to save the money for, you know, having to do something more intense in the future. I think it's all very up in the air, no decisions yeah. have been made. We're really trying to hear what the people there want okay. and speak with public safety. They don't and... understand the present value of money. <laughs> mm -hmm. They they can save that money all they want. It isn't going to be enough in the future. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, it's more just that if you put the money into it now and it floods again in 10 years and you have to do something, it's not that the money you saved does that project. It's that you didn't put 150000 or whatever it would but yeah, more but than that, if you, into it at this time, and you can put it towards other things that will have longevity to them. I mean, what they need to do is raise the roadbed, and that's you raise the roadbed. If you have to do it a little bit at a time, I mean, you it's know, expensive. it's expensive. Uh, it's yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, you can do it now, or you can do it later. <laughs> anyway, yeah. community meetings if you ever. Yeah, really yeah, I know. Build anyway. a ferry dock. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think you're just, I think you're fine in terms of Julia, you know, what you've identified. I, um, Great. Good job. All um, right. I, let's see, I have, I think just these two other maps. Um, so I'll share these. I think we've, I was going to sort of go back to the main takeaways of the assessment um, before we wrap up, but um this map is just showing uh, heat island vulnerability. So it's basically areas of town that get hotter when there are, is extreme heat. So those red areas are especially hot areas of town. Um, I think that to nobody's surprise, um, the areas that are most vulnerable to this heat island effect, you know, where the area is hotter than sort of, you know, surrounding less developed kind of more forested areas, are really sort of the town center and kind of the more developed areas um, compared to the more rural areas like Pajebscot and kind of, you know, up by the sort of, I guess that's the, I don't know if you'd call that the lower cat ants because it's not that low, but kind of mid cat ants. Um, that's the tidal portion. Yeah, the tidal portion. That's, yes, that's the way to put it. Um, and then mm -hmm. we're kind of looking at where that overlaps with conserved lands and there's, there's some overlap, um, but I think in general, you know, these more the more open spaces um, in conserved areas tend to be outside areas that are vulnerable to that heat island effect. 
Um, I think the town is, you know, we, the, the main concerns with heat, I think, are particularly vulnerable populations like you were all talking about, like older people, um, especially in people who don't have air conditioning. We're seeing more and more people in the state of Maine um, getting air conditioning, but I think that's really a concern for people who either don't have access to air conditioning um, or, you know, who are particularly vulnerable to heat. Um, and one of the other concerns is, you know, just access to open space, which I think there is a fair amount of in Topsom, um, which is, which is good. Um, the town also, when there are heat events, the town has a cooling center at the town office. Um, not every community has that. So I think that's, um, you know, the town is already doing things to help provide, um, you know, the necessary resources to people who are vulnerable. Julia? Yep. Yeah, you sort of addressed this, but it made me think of sort of the overlap with social vulnerability. Yeah. And, you know, some of the things that the town could do would be to look at more, uh, you know, street trees and yeah. and other forms of cooling rather than um, cooling centers. So yeah. that's what it made me think of looking at the overlap with, you know, looking at the green areas versus the, the uh, more uh, urban, <laughs> such yeah. as it exists in Topsom areas where there might be vulnerable populations. Yeah, I think that's a great point. We're actually, we're working on a project with TNC New Hampshire right now, looking at some urban areas, urban, I mean, they're pretty urban, Lowell, Mass, and Lawrence, Mass, Nashua, and Manchester and New Hampshire. Um, and looking at essentially sort of flooding vulnerability, heat island vulnerability, and, you know, areas like we sort of think of conservation as being these, you know, large swaths of open space for habitat. But I think I've been thinking a lot more about, like you're saying, like street trees and kind of smaller areas that, you know, provide refuge for people, um, you know, as well as, you know, habitat, even if it's not kind of you know, extensive connected habitat. So yeah, I think that's a really, um, you know, a really important point that kind of, I've, I've been changing my thinking about that personally a lot. You know, I wonder what would happen if you planted willows and for example, swamp tupelos. Willows of course are native here. Swamp tupelos are native a little farther south. Both of those trees can absorb 500 gallons or more per tree per day. What if you plant, I wonder if it would work to plant those in the places where they have both flooding and heat. I just wonder, I don't have any idea. I've never seen anything on that. Hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting so, idea. I, yeah, I, I, mean, I have not, I don't know anything about specific trees, but. Um, yeah, but there are these trees that suck up such huge issue. amounts of water. I just wonder, I've never seen anything on it either. I don't yeah. know. What a cool idea. That's really um, cool idea. The flooding so the, is not the brighter the orange, the more uh heat and that's and that's not where the where the wet areas and flooding. Yeah, there's some there overlap. is some overlap actually. Yeah. Um yeah. not in my neighborhood. But not uh, I would say less so, but um there are I mean one area that I think we were all a little confused by, and this is this is sort of modeled areas, um, you know, and it's kind of higher resolution so it's you know it's a guesstimate but i think it's kind of showing general areas but you know we were all a little bit confused about kind of the area around the muddy river i think yeah, my guess is because it's more open because it's like a marshy habitat um as yes. well that can um as opposed to like tree covered so i think that might be why um you know some areas like that and also around the cat ants too um because, uh, that may be uh, it, it is, it is, there isn't much tree cover there, but there's a lot, a lot of tall marsh grass. Yeah. So I think, you know, maybe it's not as comfortable for humans, but there aren't any humans there, but for animals, it's probably okay. I, I, that's I mean, what I would think. Yeah. What is it? The, the lighter orange is much less severe heat islands. So yeah. It's all the urban areas downtown that well, are the right orange. Yeah. More. There's some, yeah, well, I agree. It looks like, and I, few other spots but it, uh, the idea of trees encouraging tree planting is wonderful yeah yeah that's a ground I mean, covers i mean areas that are covered with dark mulch 
are going to be hotter than areas that have ground covers. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. this is true. So the last map I have, which um, we don't have to go into too much. This was sort of our way to kind of look at spatially the potential vulnerability to water supply and particularly drought conditions. Um, so looking at the areas of town that are served by the water district. So that's that purple area in here. Um, and then the blue areas are um, what are called significant um, aquifers. Mm -hmm. um, and so there are a couple of large aquifers in Topsom. Um, and those generally tend to overlap with the, the area that is served by public sewer, or sorry, public water. Mm -hmm. um, the areas, all these little points are showing groundwater wells. And like I said, this isn't a complete data set. Um, and these, the purple ones are domestic wells. Um, and all this, all I'm really trying to show you here with this is that there's a relatively small part of town that is served by um, public water. You know, it's the more populated part of town, but there is, um, you know, there's a lot of people who live outside of this area. And those are the people who are gonna be more vulnerable to drought, particularly all of the farms, um, you know, who all rely on groundwater wells. And I don't know, I. I forget your name, Mr. Watley. I forget your first name, <laughs> but I mean, you. Yeah. I think you brought this up during the during the workshop. Um, yeah. yeah, some years too much, some years not enough. <laughs> yeah. And I forgot one thing that you had also mentioned during the workshop, which we did um, include in here, is the impact of you know, with these pre precipitation events, uh, runoff from the farms to the cat ants. Um, yeah. And I think I was very focused on sort of the tops and fair mall area and kind of urban runoff. And so I think thinking about runoff from agriculture is um, something that the town should, should be thinking about too. And, um, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Bisson's farm, that's, that's what I'm thinking yeah. of. <laughs> I didn't say Bisson specifically, but. <laughs> um, well, I did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So at the beginning of the report, you can see as I scroll through, there's a lot of information in here. Um, but at the beginning of the report in the executive summary, um, we. Oh, and Victoria, this is where we summarize that community input information. And there's, we, we mentioned it sort of throughout the assessment, but this is where you can sort of see it kind of summarized. But I will also send you the, um, the notes from those, from the workshop too. Um, so, oh, sorry, I went the wrong direction. <laughs> this is the executive summary up here at the beginning. So we summarize sort of the key takeaways um, from each of those sections. It's basically everything that I just spoke at you. Um, and then here we summarized what we're calling sort of vulnerability focus areas. Um, so what some of the key considerations for different areas within town are. Um, so, you know, some roads that are vulnerable to flooding, um, to sea level rise, to erosion. Um, a couple of roads that community members mentioned that didn't come up um, or that didn't weren't shown as being vulnerable based on the models. Um, then um, the you know some other areas in town and what what particular climate hazards are impacting them or could could impact them in the future. Um, so yeah, that's sort of the the overview. Um, what would be great for you all to do when I send this to you. Um, if you could take a look at this and, you know, let us know if you have any feedback or any input. Um, don't, you know, don't feel like you have to, you know, provide high, like very specific. I know sometimes I, I provide these reports to committees and they feel like it's sort of a burden to kind of go through and do this really intensive review. So do as much as you are interested in doing. And, you know, if you want to focus on certain areas that you feel like, you know, you can provide more input on, that's great. We'll take whatever, whatever you've got. 
Um, so just take a look at it, see if it kind of makes sense to you. Um, if there are certain areas um, that we've, you know, maybe characterized incorrectly um, based on your experience, let us know. Um, if there's certain, if there's anything that we're missing, let us know. Um, there are some limitations to, to edits that we can make. Um, we can't really do additional data analyses and we can't really make additional maps. Um, but we can make adjustments to anything that we've already done, if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Um, so Sky is going to compile everybody's edits, um, and we were going to try to get everyone's edits by, I think it was Monday the 7th, which is about two weeks. Um, is that a good time frame for people? Yeah. I can stop sharing. Yeah. Okay. So I'll send this to you and just kind of summarize what I just said there um, and have everybody send comments back to Sky. Julia, I know we're over, but um, yeah. do you have like two minutes to put up that uh, visual he sent me? Because I just wanted to check the wording with the Energy Committee. Yes, I do. Let me open that up. I figure it'll be easier for you than me. This is just a two minute thing. Julia made new visual um, flyers and postcards for our November workshop. And I just was wondering if we wanted to change the wording a teeny tiny bit. Okay, share my screen. Um, is it this one you wanted to, the second I page? Think it's the same on both of them, yeah, it's just that you, you say, come share your thoughts and priorities as we update our 2012 climate action plan, which I think is what we used in July. And I have the thought that we might want to just make it a little bit more um, refined, that we're letting people know that they're pr we're prioritizing actions at this point. Yeah. And actually, yeah. Julia said something earlier yeah. in the meeting, and I wrote it down. It said, help us prioritize our potential climate actions as we update our 2012 climate action plan. But I wanted to run that past you guys since we were here. Sounds pretty good. Say it one more thing. Yes, um, I agree. Help us prioritize our potential climate actions as we update our 2012 climate yes, action plan. Yes, that's good. I think that's great. That's I think that's good. Would you be able to make that change, Julia? That seems yep. like that would be a really simple one to do. That is, yeah. Great. Yeah, I just thought, I, I, I was afraid that if it was too similar, people were going to be like, I got this. Oh, exactly. Like, yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. That's that it sounds, sounds great. It sounds more active. Yeah. Yeah, because we did they they people share their thoughts and priorities and now we're asking them to yeah, there's actually, a list of actions we're yeah. gonna give them. Yeah. Yeah. Very different activity. Perfect. <clears throat> and they may have their own ideas to add to it. Cool. Great. I will make that change. Um I will send you the vulnerability assessment. And one thing I just wanted to mention to you all, and I we can talk about this more in October, um, but I just wanted to make sure you knew that the new community action grant round is open and yeah. those are due in December. So as we're thinking about prioritizing climate actions, just something to keep in mind down the line. I don't think that we'll probably as a town be moving forward that with for this project with this round, but um, thank you for letting us know. Yeah. Um, okay. That's all I have. Thank you so much, Julia. All right. Bye, everybody. All right. Bye. Yeah, thank thank you. you. I think we do. My stomach yeah. is rumbling. <laughs> Someone's so got to do motion, it. Motion. No motion. <laughs> okay. All seconded. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Aye.